Welcome, everyone, to a special edition of the Signals from Mars uh, live stream presented to you by the Mars Attacks podcast. Uh, today, we are going to be joined by David Ellison, uh, known for his work in Megadeth, uh, amongst other things, and Drew Fortier. The two of them have worked on a book called The Sledge Chronicles, Rockstar Hitman. So we're Rockstar Hitman. So we're going to be talking to them in a little bit. They've just informed me that they're running a little late. So since I did post that we're going live with this, uh, I didn't exactly want to, um, uh, you know, make people just hang out and and think what the hell's going on. So in the meantime, we will uh, try to keep things going, and uh, we'll we'll talk a little here. We've got. People in the chat, uh, let's see, hey, it uh, looks like we have uh, uh, Jose in the chat already. Hello, Jose, my cousin over in Connecticut. I know Jeremy from the UK said he would be joining us today as well, and uh, hopefully we'll have more people joining us soon, including the two special guests. So um, for a lot of people in the States, that will be celebrating Thanksgiving tomorrow, Black Friday the following day for a lot of people as well. Due to COVID, you know, a lot of people won't be working where in previous years they probably would have. So you've got that. Um, tonight happened, well, tonight historically is the day that most, the most amount of liquor is sold in the U.S. And that happens uh because a lot of people come back from college it's the first uh like big vacation break since um you know people have gone off to college and um bars and taverns and whatever and restaurants take advantage of all this great stuff so uh there you have it that is why um more things you know more liquor is sold um, we also got the news today that the uh, football great, soccer great for you in the States, um, Diego Armando Maradona, Maradona, <laughs> um, passed away today. He had recently been operated on and he, um, he had a heart attack today. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, he leaves behind eight children from six different wives. Uh, he lived a very full life, um, at least it seems so, and he's, um, he was only 60, so kind of sad, one of those uh, athletes that as a kid, you know, there was a big legend uh, behind him, and you know, what, uh, everything that had gone on with him, and you know, unfortunately over the years, due to different things in his personal life, maybe that diminished for some people, and you know, um, I was showing my kid uh, recently, my youngest son, Adrian. Um, I was showing him footage, or we were watching a show where they had footage of him playing. And he was saying, oh my God, he, he was really good. I'm like, yeah, he's one of the best of all time. Um, coincidentally, we saw some stuff on Michael Jordan around the same time, and he said, similar. I said, well, there's a reason he was like the first guy to have sneakers named after him. So there you go. Um, anyway, um, I still have to upload last week's live stream, which will be posted because obviously once this is done, I want to post this soon as well. And, um, I keep promising the Phil Rind, uh, interview. I will post that shortly. This just happened to come up. If not, I would be posting the Phil Rind episode. Um, I'll probably just post this like within the next few days, because it's it's live, so it is what it is. Um, anyway, so um, let's check out, let's check out the website, marsattacksradio.com, recently resigned. Uh, anyway, I was describing stuff off of the website without pulling it up. It's almost as, as fun as having someone type while they're um, while they're chatting, you know. 
Uh, anyway, so the last podcast posted, episode 190. It is the Signals from Mars episode from the uh, 20th of November, um, which is actually last week. So I have posted it. Just a lot of, a lot of stuff going on, folks. <laughs> Losing my mind here. And you could also check up on the last um, live stream if you want to watch the video. Last week was a solo show. Before that, we had uh, my Galaxy of Geeks co-host, Chris Vaglio. And before that, we had um, Chris Sinzak, who had uh, joined us for the show. So uh, there you go. Checking out to make sure that uh, no guests are calling in yet. Hopefully shortly. Said they were running a few minutes late. Um, new releases. What new releases have you guys checked out? Um, I'm really enjoying this um, Killer Be Killed. Uh, just got it in the mail on vinyl. Going to be one of my Christmas gifts. Uh, pre-ordered The Refused, which isn't out on vinyl yet. And um, David Ellison released a No Covers album. Uh, something that I want to talk to him about in in a few moments. Um, the cool thing about that, I mean, for the most part... Every song that he's covered isn't something that you've heard a million times on the radio, you know. And that, to me, is like one of the biggest mistakes for, for bands, where they go ahead and they cover, you know, stuff that, um, st stuff that you already hear a million times on the radio, stuff that's already been covered to death. You know, it kind of makes no sense, at least for me. To, to, you know, do that because most people are going to go back to the originals. But, you know, so the first single they released was Wasted, the Def Leppard cover. And, man, I, got, I have to uh, applaud him for doing that. Not only is the um, cover an homage to On Through the Night from Def Leppard, um, instead of having a Les Paul, it's obviously his bass. But... Um, it's 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 just so cool that you know one of my favorite Def Leppard songs he decided to cover, which is "Wasted." And I mean, if if you look at it, you know, uh, "Free Will Burning" by Judas Priest that wasn't breaking the law, you know, um, "Tear It Loose" by Twisted Sister wasn't. We're not going to take it, you know. "Rebel Yell" is probably the most um, popular song off of this, so. Wasted Again by Def Leppard, Riff Raff, ACDC, Nail to the Gun by Fight, uh, Not Fragile, which I think is Blue Oyster Cult. Oh, let's see. Um, so let's go back to this. All right. Uh, let's see if they can jump on in shortly here. So um, let's just keep the uh, banter going here just in case. And um, all right, wonderful. This, this, I'll, I'll have to edit this in the... Um, podcast format so anyway on uh patreon today uh let me just run down some of the stuff that um that we did here and we have uh let's see christian philippines uh All right, let's see. One second, guys. Like I said, nothing more exciting than to have uh, people typing away <laughs> while you're while you're doing this stuff. Uh, let's see here. 
So let's get this stuff straightened out. Anyway, so so we have um, a bunch of different things that we posted today. So they're in five minutes. They'll be ready. Cool. So anyway, so Christian Filipinis, flames of heaven. Posted on Patreon, talking about the live stream tonight. Mexican ape lords, no deliverance, dark tranquility, eyes of the world. Live albums released historically this week. There have been a bunch of these. Um, we also talked about firstborn separate ways. Eternitas, the birthmark. Alice Cooper, rock and roll. Spread Eagle. Well, uh, there was something about um, Ray West of uh, Spread Eagles, one of his, uh, another band that he has, Weapons of a New, and I wanted people to see the differences between his voice when Spread Eagle first came out to what he's doing now, and uh, even to the solo stuff that he did. So, uh, live albums released historically this week. Let's Let's check this stuff out. Okay. This is uh, me trying to chat and talk to you guys at the same time. Um, so live albums that have um, that have come out this week. So we have Rush, R30, 30th Anniversary World Tour. Metallica, Live Ship Engine Purge, Guns N' Roses, Live Era, 87 through um, 93, Motley Crue, Live Entertainment or Death, Scorpions, Amazonia, Live in the Jungle, Black Sabbath, Live Gathered in Their Masses, Ozzy Osbourne, Speak of the Devil, and Wasp in the Raw. So Mike Jones says Rush by Good Margin. Jeremy Weltman says, same here. And Steve Hoker says, Metallica, the packaging is awesome. Guys, I got to go with Ozzy Osbourne, Speak of the Devil. So, um, I'm, I'm, I really love that album. But uh, anyway, it looks like Rush is going to be a, a runway w uh, winner here with this. Um, Waiting. Just, Just remember, remember to go to, to marsattacksradio.com for all of the great uh, links to the um, to the show, and uh, if you want to check out all all the various stuff. Um, and Mike Jones says Ozzy was too for me. I just love that um, "Speak the Devil" album, and um, it's just uh, I don't know. Uh, it was it was, it was a, a hard, hard moment, moment. You, you know. Randy had just died. died. Brad, Brad Gillis stepped in. The uh, monstrous, uh, you know, um, Floyd Rose, you know, gurgles or whatever it's called in Spanish. It's translated to gargaras, which is gurgling, <laughs> which is the technique that is used. Um, so anyway. Just, Just want to remind, remind you guys. guys. Okay, okay, so the, the Facebook group, group Mars Attacks Radio, or, or Mars Attacks Podcast, podcast excuse me. The Twitter, at Mars Aries 2005. Instagram, Mars Attacks Podcast. And the Telegram channel, Mars Attacks Podcast as well. Um, we make it easy for you, though. Just go to MarsAttacksRadio.com. You've got all this great stuff all over the top of the, um, of the page there. So, so you, you can, can just, just go to that and um, just uh, check it out. So um, we, we are, are roughly 17 minutes in. in. Let's, Let's just, just check, check out the headlines, headlines real quick, quick if, if, if we, we can, can before, uh, before, before they, they call. call. So, so let's, let's see. see. Um, ah. All right, cool. 
They're, They're ready. ready. Okay, so he's asking me to call him. So here we go. Hey, buddy, how are you? Good, how are you, sir? Good, man. Where are you at? I am in Spain. Nice, nice. How are things over there? Uh, they are very crazy over here. Um, yeah, I heard things were a little nutty. Yeah, we are um, uh, confined to... Um, uh, based, based on, on municipalities, basically. basically. So you can't you can't yeah. go beyond the adjoining town, basically. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which kind of sucks because if you have to go, you know, for food or, or whatnot, it's it's a pain in the ass. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, hey, we're we're working through it. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully the vaccine will be here and we'll be good to go. So Drew should be getting here in a minute. We we're running late on our one we we're just on. I'm gonna have to be done here. Oops. Hey, hey. Dave. Yeah, I think, I, think I, I just cut, cut Dave, Dave off there. Um, he was uh -oh. talking to me, and I tried to have you jump in, and he was telling me he has to be done shortly. So. You just want to do Dave first, and I could come back after him. Uh, it's, it's up, up to, to you. you. I mean, whatever you guys prefer. prefer. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah you, you could go ahead and do that if you want. If you want uh, to call him, give him a call back, and then just uh, uh, just let me know, and then I'll uh, jump in after Dave. Okay, that, that's cool. All right. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, buddy. All right. Yeah. Bye. Hey, Dave, you still there? I'm still here, yeah. Is yeah, Drew so, here yet or not? Yeah, he was calling in, and I went over to him, and he said he would prefer to just talk to me after speaking to you. So Okay, well, let's do this then. I got about, like, 30 minutes, and then I got to jump. So why don't we yeah. chat here for 20, 30 minutes, and then you can grab that, okay? Yeah, yeah, that's perfectly fine. We, we should be done by then without okay. a problem. Okay, good. Thanks. So, so cool. Um, right off the bat here, I mean, we're – Literally, Thanksgiving is tomorrow, so the holiday season is, is upon us. Um, what memories do you have as a kid maybe getting a vinyl or something for Christmas that really sticks to you today, like really sticks in your memory? Probably the one that the most was uh, my mom and dad gave me Queen Night at the Opera on cassette. Oh, cool. <laughs> because we had, a, we had a cassette player um, in the Wurlitzer organ that my mom and dad had bought, which was cutting edge technology for like having, you know, most people had a piano in the house. We had the organ, you know? Right. Cool. Um, but, uh, that was, and it was bizarre. Cause again, I was a, I was a kiss fan. Um, just getting into rock and roll. I remember they bought my brother Dreamboat Andy by heart and they bought okay. me night at the opera. Um, and, and I listening to it, I was like, this is very bizarre. This is a weird band, you know? I can't say I was totally drawn to it. I liked it. I didn't love it. Um, I did like Death on Two Legs. Oh, yeah. Um, of course, Bohemian Rhapsody was, you know, amazing, you know. So um, but so it, it took a little while for me to warm up to it. But, um, yeah, that's probably from a, a gift of an album. That would be the one. Okay. Um, yeah, and I mean, obviously, Death on Two Legs. And um, <clears throat> what's that, the God song, which is the start of Side 2? Yeah, um, I think which so. Is yeah, also yeah. Probably those are probably like the two heaviest songs per se off of that. Yeah, I, I would I would agree. You know, um, we just did the Ellison No Cover record and we covered Sheer Heart Attack, yeah. which is probably the other heavy song by Queen that I really liked. In fact, given the choice to record two, I would either be Sheer Heart Attack or Death on Two Legs. Yeah. Um, because they're just, they're just that I was into the heavier stuff, you know, yeah. and I, and I appreciated the vocal stuff, but I didn't know if it was sort of like a, 
You know, it's funny. I, I say this because my when my parents bought the Wurlitzer organ, which I then had to learn how to play, <laughs> one of the other cassettes, they were into, my mom is into country music, so they had like Charlie Pride and the Statler Brothers and Olivia Newton-John, all this kind of stuff. But right. the other uh, kind of rock album that they had uh, on cassette was Jesus Christ Superstar. Okay. Um, which would have had Ray Gillen or Ian Gillen, Ian Gillen from, yeah. uh, from, from Deep Purple singing on it. And, and I liked it. It was cool. It felt foreboding and forbidden. You know, it definitely right. didn't. It's like, this doesn't seem like the church hymns were singing on Sunday in the Lutheran <laughs> church. This seems kind of right. dangerous and not right, which is, I think, what, what I liked about it. It was, sure. I think, us rockers, you know, we always liked the stuff that was like, oh, shouldn't have that. It's like, yeah. you know, it's like the forbidden fruit, you know. So, so, so that's, that's interesting, you know, a correlation, correlation between, between you mentioned Sheer Heart Attack and you mentioned No Cover. With no Cover, obviously, the cover paying homage to uh, On Through the Night by Def Leppard. Uh, yeah, right. I actually have one right here, yeah. Yeah. Um, the funny thing is, uh, Brave Words, just, well, they post like daily Brave History and different things, and mm -hmm. they posted the release of Queen's Sheer Heart Attack album. And they posted a video of the song Sheer Heart Attack. And I wrote in and I said, hey, you know, the music nerd in me, you know, the Larry David in me kind of got anal about this because Sheer Heart Attack is often news for the world. I said, similar right. to On Through the Night by Def Leppard, the song yeah. On Through the Night didn't appear up until High and Dry. High and Dry, yeah. Um, and yeah. then Sheer Heart Attack is the same thing. That was on, um, it was off of... Um, <clears throat> Ah, uh, fuck, it's the Well, album. Sheer Heart Attack was off News of the World. Right, and Sheer Heart Attack is the album. That's right. And so Sheer Heart Attack, right. yeah, and I, which I found very odd. I thought that was kind of weird. Then, I don't know if you noticed this, but on the very first Queen album, they actually spelled John Deacon's name Deacon John. Oh, wow. Did you notice that? No, I had, I, I, had a, that. I had a vinyl. I had a vinyl. And that very first Queen album is very kind of, again, dark and foreboding. It kind of reminds me of the first Black Sabbath album. It, it, right. It's a kind of low budget. Um it's but it, it it's kind of haunting in a weird way and i remember they spelled his name deacon john maybe that was just a what a, a single pressing and then they fixed it i don't know but uh you know i thought that was kind of interesting you know deacon john and it's funny you mentioned that um pat travers uh, an album of his that I really loved was Putting It Straight, um, where he's standing in the record, kind of like this, in front of a record company mogul with a bunch of gold and platinum records, and he's, and he's right. got his guitar, and then on the back, he's played, and the records are all trashed, and the office is a mess. And Nico McBrain played on that, but okay. his name was spelled Nico McBain. <laughs> which I was, I was going, and I've never asked Nico this, I need to ask him this, because his, his name was Nico McBain, but then when he joined Iron Maiden on Peace of Mind, where they had the brains and the, you know, they're sitting at their table, and then his name became Nico McBrain. So I wonder if they made him change his name or if he decided to change his name when he joined Iron Maiden. Interesting. There's a fact or fiction. We should figure that out. We'll ask Nico next time we see him. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, you, you mentioned, mentioned no cover, cover. Uh, so, so we'll, we'll just hop on that real quick. quick. Um, was, was there, there anything, anything that you wanted to cover or maybe you tried covering that didn't work out, that didn't make the album? You know, it's funny. Our Tom Hazart and, and our designer, Melody Myers, Tom was talking to Melody when I goes, oh, my God, David's killing me. He's calling me every day with like five <laughs> new songs he wants to cover, you know. And, and she said, she goes, well, when he gets the sticks, that's when you know it's time to stop. And so it's funny. I literally, we had all these songs. because I'm, I'm a huge sticks fan. I love the first my my jam was Grand Illusion, everything from the beginning up to Grand Illusion. That was my sticks era. In fact, pieces of eights and that I I didn't I didn't I at least I heard it on the radio, of course, but I didn't buy those records. <clears throat> um, so I you know, and to me, probably the the more heavier track would be probably be Miss America, which James Young okay. sings. And uh, and I I think I brought that up and go, well, you know, we could always do Miss America by sticks and, and that's when Tom went all right that's it we're done that 18 <laughs> songs we're done so uh I don't know I don't know why sticks was the cutoff line so we'll have to include them on no cover volume two <laughs> there you go um so, so was, was there, there anything, anything else that you recorded that just didn't make the album that you felt wasn't as strong as the other songs no not at all in fact in fact we thought about maybe holding a couple of these back you know tom had a heart attack in mid-july okay. um right as we started mixing um we we started record with the idea came up like kind of let's call it first week of june 
started putting the tracks down immediately. Um, so within about five weeks, all the tracks were pretty much done. We had a couple guests like Dave Lombardo came in a little bit later. We, when we were able to, uh, get his tracks in, um, other than that, you know, maybe some stuff like love hurts Beth, that Tom, actually Tom and Tyson brought Beth in right at the very end. And some of the stuff, because we'd always hit Bumblefoot at like midnight and go, dude, can you throw some backing vocals on this to sweeten this up for us? <laughs> so, you know, Bumble <clears throat> and Bumble would always get the email at, at night and he's a late owl. So he'd stay up all night cutting vocals for us. But right. uh, a couple of tracks, Sweet F.A. and Over the Mountain. Um, Sweet F.A. was my choice. Over the Mountain was actually Tom's choice. Um, and he was going to sing on over the mountain, but he had his heart attack and it just kind of pushed it back a little bit. He, he wasn't feeling sweet FA. Of course, lyric lyrically, that would, that's kind of a challenging song to sing in these times. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> Todd did a really good job of kind of tweaking the lyric a little bit. So it wasn't, right. you know, wasn't a problem. Um, but, but Tom, he, you know, when he kind of came out of the fog from the heart attack a couple weeks later, he sat back. He said, you know, man, those guys did a great job. Andrew Freeman on Over the Mountain and Todd Kearns. It's just, I mean, Todd's just, he just did such an amazing job on sweet. I mean, that sweet stuff is like singing a Bohemian Rhapsody. I mean, right. the, the, the the complexity and the the orchestration of, of the vocals are just incredibly uh, just brilliant. You know, especially again, that's that was what, early 70s, 73, mm -hmm. 74 um, so, um, Tom just said, he goes, you know what, those guys, they did great. I'm not even going to go near it. I'm just going to leave those guys alone. I won't even be on those tracks. So, um, we, we thought about maybe holding a couple back, but you know, as we got to it, honestly, I think what, what the deciding factor was, is we realized to put 15 songs was too much for one CD. Mm -hmm. So that automatically pushed us over into a double CD, double vinyl situation. And then we just went, you know what, screw it, just throw it all on there. And <laughs> and quite honestly, right at the last minutes, uh, there's a song on here that's not credited. Um, right. It's a hidden track, which is Downed by Cheap Trick, which is uh, uh, our friend Chips Enough. Um, and me, uh, Vinny Drombowski from uh, Sponge. Mm -hmm. And uh, Drew Fortier uh, played on that. Um, and that is a hidden bonus track that we added um, because it it because the, the core of this is the Ellison band. So it has a, right. a pretty unified sound. And as we brought guests in, um, they sort of dovetailed in real nicely to the sound of, of the record, you know, um, the the track. Uh, downed sits a little outside of that. We remixed it, and I think it, it fits very nicely now. But it it is. It's a little Easter egg. So if, if you have the CD, let it play. Pass fast way, say what you will, and you'll get a nice little hidden bonus in there. Yeah, with, with two guys from the uh, Chicagoland area that grew up and lived and yeah. breathed cheap tricks. So, I mean, perfect combination yeah. there. And now Drew, Vinny, and Mike Keller and I have another record that we just did this last year that we're going to put out uh, probably next year under the name Lucid. Okay. And um, we'll probably include that version, that Chips Enough version oh, of okay. Downed on there since those guys, you know, are part of that that track. So, and, and it'll be a good fit over there. I think it'll sound right on that record, too. Okay. And that's, that's interesting, interesting because, because I, I, I wanted, wanted to ask you about, about how it really seems after you left Megadeth, you really had like a big giant spurt of inspiration. Um, mm. I don't know if it was because maybe you had more time or, you know, things in life had changed. But from then to today, I mean, obviously you're, you've done, you know, your, your books. Um, you've done the Elson albums. You're doing this Lucid project. You did the project with, um, with Frankie from Anthrax. Um, what and the coffee? I don't want to forget the coffee. Um, yeah. What triggered that? I mean, what was it that you personally needed? You did you have all this stuff cooped up in you? You really needed to get it out, or? Well, I think it's a little bit of all of it. You know, lifestyle change. Um, you know, I think when you're in a band, and those look those first twenty years of Megadeth, pre sort of the breakup, if you will. Um, right. You know, we needed to be solely united. The only one who ever did any real... So Dave put out MD45. Um, uh, I wrote a book, Making Music Your Business. Marty, of course, was already under contract with Shrapnel. So when he joined Megadeth, we already had kind of a workaround strategy to allow him to put his 
solo records out that he was under contract with. And, and, you know, and, but that was very strategic in how to do that. So that it wouldn't interfere with, with Megadeth. Um, but when you're building a band like that, and especially to the, to the, in the impact and the, the heights that we took that band to, you know, you can't have four guys off doing solo projects. I mean, right. I see these other bands, you know, do this. It's like, dude, stay in one band for a minute, you know, <laughs> develop that, you know, really create right. something, you know, I mean, I, I look, we watch kiss, right. I mean, yeah. again, they, they did so four solo records. It was very strategic. It was, a, as we now know, was a method of trying to keep the band together rather than letting it fall apart because people wanted to go elsewhere. Um, but you know, the other thing that happens inside bands when you're a band is, is not everybody's voice is going to get heard. Right. Um, it just, it just isn't. And I think inside of Megadeth through the nineties, especially my voice was definitely heard late eighties or and through the nineties it was, but by the time 2000 came around, it was being reframed. Dave is writing all the songs. Um, and when Dave put the band back together in 2004, he said, he goes, we're going to do everything my way. And that meant basically, you know, those, the collaborative days were over. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's part of why I didn't come back to it at that point. You know, I was enjoying a new season of my life. I was working for PV. I went to college after that. I had my little band F5. And, and I told guys in F5, I said, look, don't ever plan on making any money with this. This is not going to be Megadeth. I, had, I was very realistic about everything. Right. Um, but it was, you know, I was already kind of midstream in, in another sort of pattern. And, and I never thought it was going to be the end of my days in Megadeth. In fact, I was hoping that Dave and I would, you know, find a, a nice uh, common ground again, which we did in 2010. And, and I think at that point, you know, to Dave's credit, he reframed Megadeth. He, he built it back up the way that he wanted it to be, that it needed to be as a, as a, as a thrash band again, because that was really part of what the thing fell apart was, uh, was, uh, you know, we had, you know, different band members, managers, people coming in and trying to make Megadeth be, you know, competitive in the, in the marketplace rather than just fucking being Megadeth, you know? Right. And, so, you know, Dave got three records through the 2000s to reframe that. And, and you know, he and I think he did a good job with that. And, and quite honestly, as a friend to him, as a friend of the band, I kind of needed to just let him do that. You know, I wasn't ready to come back into the band under those parameters at that time. And so it was, you know, let's as out of love and respect, quite honestly, I was like, you know what, then I'll unhook myself and I'll let you go do that. And, and that's why I think in 2010, when I came back to the band, um, you know, respectfully, we were both like, Hey, I got to do my thing. He got to do his thing. Let's come back together as Megadeth. Now it's even bigger. And look what it, it looked, it put another 10 years of life in the band, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, and our goal now is to finish strong, uh, with Megadeth, you know, to really keep it going. And, and, and even creatively, I I've always said, when we came back, I said, Dave, you write the songs, you know, let's not get into these conflicts about trying to write inside the band. I've got other outlets. I can write other places. I can put things out creatively. Cause I'm not going to let that go. I'm going to keep those things going and I'll be respectful to not let them get in the way of Megadeth. But at the same time, you know, Dave, you write great Megadeth songs, man. I, I'm, I'm here to play bass to your songs. And that's really been my mindset the last 10 years that I've been back is, is get behind Dave. He's fucking one of the greatest metal songwriters ever. And just be be his lieutenant, you know, be be the wind in his sails. And, and so I kind of try to diffuse some of those collaborations inside of inside of Megadeth, because I, I know I know where the trouble spots lie. You know what I mean? And so I'd rather just get behind Dave and go, dude. Fucking knock it out, write a badass song and I'll, I'll freaking play bass to your song, you know? And, and then meanwhile, I come over here and I get to do these other things, yeah. you know, now under my own name or with other people collaborations and, and, um, you know, and as much as I may be the most kind of well-known or maybe famous guy in the room, I don't have to always be the boss either. You know what I mean? Right. It's, I, I'm, I'm okay being a member amongst members and, and maybe that's kind of a being a bass player. Maybe it's sort of an attitude <laughs> of being a bass player, being from Minnesota. I don't know. I just like to play music, man. I like to play music with my friends and great songs and 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 make great quality products and, and have things that our fans enjoy. So, you know, the coffee, the book, the album, I mean, it's all just part of just I wake up in the morning and go, awesome, let's write a book, you know. Cool, let's record some songs. <laughs> hey, great, let's make some coffee, you know. <laughs> so it's uh, <laughs> It all happens kind of right here in this room, actually. 
that, is, is that, that like, like a, a bass, bass player thing with like Gene Simmons, Simmons trying to pimp all his stuff? Is is, is that an influence <clears> for you to get involved but in I, all these things? I'm not I'm not out trying to pimp things. You know, I'm not trying okay. to be Donald Trump. Trust me. You know, I'm not out right. to say, hey, I'm great and everything I touch turns to gold and I'm right and you're wrong and you're fired. And I mean, I'm not that guy at all. Okay. In fact, I'm I'm collaborative, inclusive. And like to bring community together, you know, and, and, and look, Tom Hazard, you know, he, he, you know, we just had this random kind of meeting, <coughs> um, a few years back in 2015, <clears throat> he was putting together a, a, uh, soundtrack thing for shout factory with the, over the, the shocker film, you know, with no more Mr. Nice guy. And Tom's a huge Megadeth fan. He really gets, you know, the, the band and, and, you know, the, 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 it impacted his life and we became friends. And then we started the record label and the coffee and, and, um, you know, we created the base story platform for me to go out and, and tour kind of as a solo clinic thing. And then that turned to one day I invited him on stage to sing a song with me and now we're writing songs together. And, you know, and so it's it, none of this stuff is really kind of planned to be honest with you. It's just, right. It's very organic, just living in the moments. Just it's like, wow, I never thought that would happen. Let's let's follow that. That's cool, you know. And and I think that's what keeps it fun. It's what it keeps it inspired. I think sometimes when you when you try to move things too fast or farther than they're meant to go, you can hit a wall. You can get frustrated, and you start arguing internally. Um, so if you can kind of just sort of. You know, I always say I don't live in the black and the white. I live in the middle because that's where all the color is. Right. Great point. Um, so, so one, one of the reasons, reasons why I'm talking to you is because you're about to put out another book, mm -hmm. uh, The Sledge Chronicles, Rockstar Hitman. Um, tell me about how this came about and how this differs from the other books that you've written in the past. Well, so far, the other four books that I've written, <clears throat> Making Music Your Business was a sort of a how-to uh, music business book. Um, I put out a lyric and poetry book called Unsung Words and Images. <clears throat> um, and then I have two memoirs, My Life at Death and More Life at Death. This, what's different about Rockstar Hitman is, first of all, it's fiction. Um, okay. And so um, anything goes, you know. Um, <laughs> and and I, I started, I kind of bloom where I plant, where I'm planted here in rock and roll. And so I sort of took the character to develop it from there. Um but with it, it's not my story. Um, obviously, there's little bits and pieces you can kind of draw on, you know, to sort of embellish the story. But it, it's fictional and the names and the characters and everything. And it's fictional. But, um, you know, it's 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 it, I think probably the a couple of things about it is one when when Drew I, I started writing it and I hit Drew right away because I go, dude, I think this is right up your alley because we're working on this uh, film Dwellers together. It's his right. film, but we're putting it out through Ellison Films in uh, February. And I hit him up. I said, dude, this has got your sick, twisted mind all over, you know, <laughs> because um, I can get the character sledge around the world and do the rock and roll stuff. But I said, dude, you you've got a great, brilliant mind for, you know, coming up with thriller horror type of stuff. So it, it's right. not a horror book. It's, it's an action thriller book. Um, and so we really have a, not only are we, I think really good as collaborators, we've got a collaborative voice. Like you can't hear like, well, David wrote that. And then Drew wrote this. Like, that's the thing okay. is you got to kind of find a narrative and stick with it. And, and I, one of the things that I think was, was fun about this is that we wrote it from the point of view of the character sledge. It's him telling the story. So it's very kind of rock and roll autobiography memoir style, mm -hmm. um, which I think is in line with what fans like to read when they read, when they read our own memoirs. Right. Cool. Um, th that's, that's interesting, interesting because, because I mean, with all the different things that we've talked about, whether it's this book, whether it's your work, uh, with the Ellison music, whether it's Megadeth, it seems like you've always been good at finding people to work with, like to really, you know, you have Tom with your Ellison stuff, you have uh, Drew with this, and obviously with Dave, you have that dynamic. So it seems like you're always looking for a good dynamic to kind of leverage and get the best out of you and out of that other person. Well, there's a saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, <laughs> go together. Okay. You know, and I think that that applies, you know, that to me, life is not a solo project. 
You know, right. uh, I've, I've never picked up the bass wanting to be a solo artist. I always wanted to be in a band, be part of a tribe, be part of a, a collaborative outfit. And that also means you don't always get to have your own way. Sure. You know, that, that sometimes you, you find compromise in things. Um, and, you know, marriage is like that. Being in a band is like that. Own, having a company is like that. Um, it, and, and, you know, I think one of the things... Look, you see it with the changing of our president here in the United States. What what our recent president forgot is that when you're the top guy, you're not you're not doesn't mean you get your way. It means you're the ultimate servant, right? It's the inverted right. triangle, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 I, I was fortunate enough, someone pointed it out to me many years ago. They said, you know, remember when you're at the top, you're you're you, everybody may report to you, but you ultimately answer to them. You know, and at the bottom of that triangle, in our case, are the fans and then the business and then the managers and the band. And then you're, at, you know, and when you and that really helped me keep perspective that it's like, you know, what, when you're at the top, you're ultimately at the bottom serving up to everybody else. You know, and I think in our business, it's always about our about our fans. You know, yeah, look, we, right. we have to create the stuff. You know, we got to have our space away to come up with these ideas and stuff. But, you know, as you put them out there and you, and you, you know, you're, you're, I think in my mind, and I'm, well, I guess I'm probably lucky. I grew up in, in Megadeth like that, that, you know, it's always, our fans made us who we were, you know, when MTV went away and radio stopped playing our tracks and, you know, whatever happened in the world, you know, our fans are the ones that kept the lights on for us, you sure. know? So I think that, that, that everything that we have, and Tom is great at that. He's really good at, at really keeping, you know, the, the, the David Ellison narrative, uh, either with Megadeth or with Ellison or whatever we're doing, um, that, you know, <clears throat> we're all, we're all connected as a, as a tribe here, you know? So better to be in the band than to, than, than to be trying to go solo, you know, I think is my kind of my lesson with that. Okay. And last thing I want to ask you about, because in my opinion, it was one of my favorite releases to come out in 2019. It was the Altitudes and Attitude album that you released with Frank Bello, um, which really surprised me about how much I actually liked the album in the end. And I remember speaking to Frank years before that. And he said, uh, well, we've got the entire, a full length done. You know, we did the EP like last year and we've got the full length done. But we both have day jobs called Anthrax and Megadeth. So we got to wait to put this out. Um, to me, well worth the wait. Um, is there anything that you project doing with Frank in the future? Uh, <coughs> well, we're actually scheduled to be on a cruise. We're scheduled to be on the Monsters of Rock cruise. Okay. In February, which I'd have to think at this point may get postponed. Uh, I don't think cruises are going to be sailing in February due to COVID. I, I could right. be wrong. I'm, I'm, um, but um, you know, around that, Frank and I, our original idea when we when we con committed to the cruise back in January of this year was, hey, let's try to get in and bang another song or two out, even if we just put it out digitally as a digital download. Um, there's certainly material laying around and I think Frank's at home working on a solo record, which is great. Um, you know, look, we, and we've been in our bands a long time and I've gone through, as we started the interview with the transitions of in and out of Megadeth and the different things. And, and I've said yes, and just move forward. Frank hasn't had quite that same experience. I mean, for a period, he was not playing in anthrax. He was in helmet and doing right. some stuff. So he's had that, ex that excitement of like, wow, I get to kind of be Frank Bello, um, and not just Frank, Frank Bello of Anthrax. Mm -hmm. So with, with Altitudes and Attitude, I really, first of all, we were on some bass clinics, uh, during the big four. And that's when the idea came to me for us to write some songs and, you know, create some kind of an outlet together, which became Altitudes and Attitude. But as we got, went through the process, I realized with Frankie, man, you know, it's funny, Frank always puts out on stage this big, happy, smiley, you know, the Frank Bello look. And as, but as I got to know him as a person, as a, as a songwriter, there's a lot of, there's some deep sadness and some things in his life, which he's now talked about through his songs, you sure. know, um, of some things in his life that he's, that he's disclosed to, to us here. And it, it, it opens him up to, you realize, wow, there's a different guy there. And that's who we're hearing through this A and A music and mm -hmm. probably through his solo music. So I really embrace that. You know, I, I mean, I wrote, obviously stuff for a and a but uh, as frank was bringing these songs in i could tell they he needed to say he needed to speak that song and the lyric 
Uh, when he writes, he writes a mu- song and a ly- a, the lyric and the music right away together. They're they're in they're you can't separate them. You know they're 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 intertwined. Um, and um, I again, I kind of just championed that, and I was like, you know, Frank, if if you write you know half of these songs or more, I'll play bass to you, dude. You write great stuff, man. I'm got, I'm I'm proud to be your brother and your friend and. And sort of help create because I do a lot of the kind of the biz behind the scenes and business and some of the, you know, some of that stuff as well. So, look, I'm happy to help put all this together so that we've got a platform and, and help give you a voice um, away from anthrax in a way that's respectful to anthrax, you know. Uh, and quite honestly, the anthrax organization was very was very uh, supportive of Frank, you know, and I pointed that out to him. I said, by the way, your, your home team here is very supportive of you. <laughs> Remember that when you go in and recut another anthrax <laughs> record, you know, because right. I said, listen, I get it. And I, I said, look, we're all grown ups here. We, we all need a little space away from sure. from the home team to do our thing. And and, and I, I really can't say enough good about their organization. They're very supportive to Frank, to me as well, um, to, to just let us go out and do that and, and talk about it on their social media and, and help and help promote that for us. Very cool. And uh, to wrap things up, you. You have been doing some shows here. Um, what's it been like? I mean, obviously, there aren't as many people out at shows, but being in a band and playing through COVID, what's it like for you taking precautions and, you know, what type of things do you have to do before going into a live setting to make sure that you and your band is safe? Well, look, I'll... First of all, it felt awesome to go play. <laughs> I mean, it just, for, forget about anything else. It just felt good to be on stage playing. The fans were so excited to just be out doing something. With that said, uh, these shows were booked a couple months ago before this whole lockdown and everything started to happen again. And uh, we went into it, especially as we were coming into it last week. We went, man, we have really got a funny. My friend John Acolino, um, who played on the Not Fragile Right. track uh he's in in icon he's got this new product called thero theroworks okay and you basically lat it's like a foam and you lather it up and you put it on your face and in kind of in your tear ducts and your lips and up in your nose so i was lathering up with that stuff like getting you know and then of course masked up and bumblefoot was you know he was always masked up um Look, first of all, we don't want to get sick. You know, who the right. hell wants to get this thing? And we certainly don't want to invite our fans as lambs to the slaughter for sure. them to get sick. You know, uh-huh. we want everybody to be safe. Um, in fact, it came to a certain point last week where we just kind of stopped promoting at all that we were even doing these shows, kind of right. going, hey, if you don't want to come, believe me, we're cool that we understand. <laughs> um, and uh, but yet we'd made the commitment to do it. So we we. You know, I literally, I just say a prayer, God protect us, you know, we're going in, you know, and just, you know, put some protection over us and the fans and everybody here and just go in and do it. And, uh, um, you know, definitely tried to be respectful of it because it's not something to mess around with. And, and so just, just, I wanted that to be very clear that we weren't out trying to be, you know, some rebel rockers, you know, in the, in the face of COVID. Cause there, there are, there were some fans that were, that were, you know, that was all conspiracy and it was like, Hey, Hey, Hey time out we're not going there with any of that crap you know yeah. this is not what that is about at all man it's uh um the threat is real <laughs> to use a megadethism you know it, it 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 very much was uh something to be respected but yeah i mean look you know to be on stage with a mask um you know you know lathering up in sanitizer and touching things and wiping your phone down and you know especially as you after the show we'd go out we'd sign some cds and stand at the merch booth and stuff so i mean it's you know keeping a very orderly distance of things um but people were respectful i mean it's it, it, it it's, it's this one moment in time where like rock and roll he even has to play by the rules you know at least you're you're wise if you do you know so right. com- big big kudos to the promoter and the venue and venues and the fans for you know for for just really being respectful about how how it all went down excellent well i want to thank you for your time and i want to thank you for for all the music for all the years you know thank you for being part of the soundtrack of my life and for many other fans out there um where should people go to keep up with everything that you have going on um, well, davidalson.com is kind of my main hub. Obviously, Megadeth stuff's at megadeth.com. 
Um, we, uh, there is a, uh, Ellison book company, uh, URL going up, I think this week, okay. um, over on the facebook.com slash David Ellison is kind of the main hub for where all the, this stuff is, you know, David Ellison, YouTube as well, Twitch, David Ellison official. So I don't know, just put David Ellison in Google. I'm sure it'll come up. <laughs> I'm sure it'll take you somewhere. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Well, Again, Again, I appreciate, I appreciate your, your time, time. and um, good, good luck with, with, with everything, everything that's going on. I'll talk, talk to Drew now a little bit more about the book and about Dwellers, which he's uh, really yeah. uh, happy to talk about. He's a good man, that guy. Absolutely. So, uh, cool, man. Well, good good to chat again. All right. See Thank you in the you, new sir. year. Yep. See you. Okay. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. And there you go. That's... Uh, Live, flying by the seat of my pants here. So uh, let's see if we can get Drew in here. And um, let's see, let me hit him up on Facebook here. Yeah, so Jeremy is saying, is chiming in. So here we go. Hey, what's up? Uh, what's going on there, sir? Good. How are you doing, sir? I am doing excellent. Just wrapped up with um, with David, and I've got some people chiming in on the chat saying that they enjoyed the interview. So. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. I was watching the interview myself. It was, it was great. Awesome. I, I'm happy that you uh, enjoyed it. So it's, it's great to uh, talk to you finally. I mean, uh, your name comes up every year when I'm setting up the, the Rock and Pod uh, website. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah. so you know, Chris and Zach always says, well, you know, we've got these guys coming back, you know, another year. And, um, and it was funny because earlier today, uh, I was talking to Chris, and um, we had done the live stream a few weeks ago, and uh, you know I've had uh, I've, I've had friends from other shows be my guinea pig to uh, work some of the kinks out here before getting people like yourself or or David Ellison on, and uh, and I'd actually worked it out so that you know all three of us could appear on at the on the screen at the same time and this and that, and I was mentioning uh, to him I said well you know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying, trying to go, you know, 50-50 with the questions here. And, um, and he says to me, he says, well, one thing you'll find out about Drew real quickly is that there's zero ego, that he doesn't, you know, he's not going to care if there are more questions going towards Dave than there are towards him. So, um, like I said, I, well, I can't hear you. Okay, okay I'm, I hear you, but really, really low. <laughs> it, it like the audio like slowly went away. Is it me? No, it wasn't me. Um, Can you hear me still? Want well, me to jump out and jump back in and see if that works? Okay, let's try that. Okay. Oh, no, I still can't hear you. Oh. Um, okay. Uh, give me Okay. Give me one second. I got you. I got you, Big. I can hear you now. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I'm so sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Don't, don't worry about it. These, these, these things happen. <laughs> the the, the uh, technology part of things is so great to kind of get us all together. You know, me being in Europe, you being, uh, I'm assuming, in the Chicagoland area, no? I'm, I'm actually in uh, Indianapolis now. You're in Indianapolis, okay. So, either either way, we're like 8,000 miles apart, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, That's incredible. That's when, amazing. When technology works, it's great, but when it starts 
doing what I just said. It's very frustrating. Fear Factory made a whole career about singing songs about technology that goes wrong. <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 <laughs> So, so let, let me actually get, get you on screen here. I was yammering away with just me on screen. But uh, okay. anyway, um, so, so I've, I've got, got a few uh, questions, questions here for you. you. Uh, first, first of all, uh, Dave, Dave was, was talking, talking to me about the Sledge Chronicles. Chronicles. Oh, um, yeah. Rockstar, Rockstar Hitman. Hitman. He, he talked, talked about – there you go. He, he, t- t- he talked, talked about the process and how he started – you know, you know putting, putting things, things together, together for the book, book and then realized from your background in working with horror stuff that it would be right up your alley to help work with him on this book. And I think if nothing else, I, I mentioned this to, to David, that he's always been great to find the right players to sort of bounce things off, of, whether it's you, whether it's Tom Hazar, whether it's the dynamic that he has with Dave Mustaine, you know, so... He's, He's always been, been good, good at leveraging, you know, the people that he has around him. Um, what was it like for you to have Ellison approach you and ask you to uh, to help write the book? Oh, it was great, man. He's a Ellison's a wonderful collaborator, and uh, he did very very fun to please too in that regard. Because um, yeah, he uh, just texted me out of the blue and like, "Hey, Drew, what do you think about uh, you know help me write a book?" And I was all for it. And uh, he kind of laid down the, the whole idea about how it was uh, brought to his attention by a friend in, I believe, South America who was convinced that he was, Ellison was some kind of hitman because he's always in like a different part of the world at different at different times, suspiciously. Right. And uh, and he just he just kind of took that idea and ran with it. And he just, uh, you know, kind of handed it, filled me in on the whole thing. And uh, I loved it. I thought it was great. And, uh, and I just kind of helped build the character of uh, Sledge. Originally, Sledge had a full name, but we kind of shortened it down to Sledge. And uh, and the, the way he becomes Sledge is in the book, and it's it's kind of a cool story. And uh, and uh, but yeah, it, it was bouncing ideas off of Dave is great. And uh, you know he, you know, I hit him with something, he hits me with something, especially with a lot of the uh, the brutality in the book, like a lot of the killings and all that, and a lot of the twists and turns that you wouldn't expect and everything, and the way. A lot of vivid descriptions of uh, some of the, the awful things that happen, but you can't stop reading when you start uh, start going for it, you know. Right. And uh, <clears throat> and uh, and Sledge himself, the character, I kind of because uh, you read a lot, of, a lot of these books, and they're all just like super, just you know, badass, just a heroic kind of kind of people. But I went more of a unique alternative approach where he's he's more like an Ash from Evil Dead, more like an anti-hero Gosh. where he does he does screw up and it's quite funny, you know. <laughs> and uh, and there's a lot of a lot of, a lot of very messed up things happening uh, with, with, with all that too. And I, I think people are going to get a kick out of the book. It's 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 really grounded and it's not really kind of uh it's it's not uh, pretentious in the slightest bit where, where a lot of those books are, you know. So I just wanted right. wanted to kind of go against the grain with the voice of it, and uh, and as as kind of gives people kind of like a you know different kind of take on the, the the rock star hero character where he's more like a Bruce Campbell kind of anti hero, just kind of just fumbling around here and there, but still somehow managing to get the job done. You know? Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, he, he was, was also, also mentioning, mentioning that a lot of how the story is told is reminiscent of lyrics and songs, uh, like the approach of how lyrics are, um, I guess, portrayed within a song, how there it's a lot of times a character talking about, you know, an experience or whatnot. So that's sort of, you know, translated over to the book as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, I think you made the reference before. It's kind of like writing a song where, like, hey, what do you think about this chorus? What do you think about this chord progression right. and all that? It's like, oh, man, that's great. We should go with that and, and build upon that. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, in, in a way, it was uh, making this book was kind of like writing a song, like a like a big 212 page song. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I'm really, really proud of the way it came out. And um, but uh, but yeah, that, that, that's definitely a, a good analogy there for sure, where it's kind of like uh, just kind of working on one big song and uh very very brutal brutal song well she I'll, I'll make sure you get a copy of the book so you can see what i'm talking about but it's uh, cool. some parts are just like oh man it's <laughs> breathtakingly br- uh, brutal for sure awesome is there anything that you guys uh started putting together and said well maybe we're going a little too far with this we need to cut it back 
Surprisingly, no. I hit him with some pretty messed up stuff, and he loved it all. I was like, there's no way he's going to go for this. There's no right. way. This, there's is this, one one that, this is the one where he's going to say, no way, we can't do this. But he... Exactly. I was, like, I was like, I'm like, let's see how far we could take this. And there's, uh, right. there's one torture scene that, the, that Sledge, that the character goes through in this motel room. And it, uh, if you ever seen the movie Marathon Man, it's kind of like that on steroids, okay. where it's like this has to do with his teeth and like an eyeball and everything. It's uh, it, and I was like, there's no way Dave's gonna go for this. And and even in the most you know messed up moments, there's there's comedy there too. There's like, oh man, no, no way this is going on right now. And sure enough, it is. But uh, but yeah, so he he went for everything. So I'm excited. We're we're in the midst of doing the next book. So I'm gonna see if I can finally get and be like, nope, can't put that in there. <laughs> <laughs> that's great um you, you also, also mentioned, mentioned and, and he brought it up as well that you're working on dwellers um, yeah tell us a little bit about that oh man that's uh that was so much fun to put together man because it's um it, it's a found footage horror movie it's like blair witch meets uh chud chud is this 80s horror movie about sewer monsters you know okay. and government conspiracies and all and i've always loved the movie chud it's got like a nice like cult fan base and originally dwellers started off as a remake of chud i was in okay. touch with the guy who wrote chud and uh it made a treatment and all that and everything and he he loved it he was like let's 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 see if we can make this happen as a found footage movie because it's cheaper that way you know because mm -hmm. the whole movie is told through the perspective of the documentary camera like there's there's no there's no there's not one set up shot in the whole movie if, if that makes sense you kind of okay. just go along for the ride and um but uh when it came down to securing the rights for uh, for chud it was it was impossible to for one to track down them you know when you track it down it was just way of course too much money as anything goes in the film business so i had that I, that was a couple of years ago and then I was thinking one day I was like okay Ellison's got coffee he's got record label he's got you know everything else and I was like let's, let's pitch Ellison films and send him an email and he was like let's do it and I just kind of told him the basic idea of the movie he's like love it let's let's make it happen so I uh, gathered up uh, the, the the troops and we shot most of it in Ohio and a lot of us play ourselves like uh, I got my start as a documentary filmmaker with the bang tango movie and so I, I play myself you know as myself pretty much where um uh, and david's in the movie too as the producer of the movie which he is in real life it gets kind of confusing as you can tell it's like very right. meta you know and uh and so pretty much him and tom hire me to do a documentary about the missing homeless in uh in this area in ohio and they did you know nobody knows what's going on the press are overlooking it the local authorities don't draw any attention to it and so i uh gather up my crew of uh, Doug Esper and James L. Edwards, who play themselves as well, and we start interviewing the, the homeless people <clears throat> and uh, kind of digging deeper into what's going on. And uh, some people are saying there's like, you know, something in the sewers, some kind of mutated something that keeps on taking people out and nobody wants to draw attention to it because there's some kind of government conspiracy with it and everything. And other people, they, they, we interview some authorities and they're like, oh, there's nothing going down on down there. It's just all being blown out of proportion. And so, of course, the with the second third act of the movie we we're like let's go into the sewers ourselves and see what's going on and that's when it really starts taking off <laughs> right. and uh and it's it's a bloody good time uh, for sure and it's I, you know what uh, to be honest with you i wouldn't even call it a horror movie it's uh it's definitely got horror elements but it's just uh it's it's, uh, it's more about the story like there's a lot more to it and uh that, that i'm saying right now but i think people are going to get a kick out of it it's definitely an alternative uh film for sure it's it's a whole di different kind of experience it's not a uh, a formal movie, if you will, but it's 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 pretty cool to watch. Okay, and how, how different, different is it for you to work within, within say, the horror genre than it is being the director of a documentary? It's the same exact thing. Is it? Okay. <laughs> it's 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 all horror. It's all horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was uh, it was it was cool. I mean, the the, the Bang Tanga movie that 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 thing took four years uh, to make. And to be honest with you, I had no clue what I was doing the, the first couple of years. I just I met the band at a bar, and I happened to have a camera in my hand, and so I took the opportunity and ran with it, and uh, kind of learned trial by fire how to how to make a movie pretty much. And I, I roped in Dee Snyder to do the opening narration. Ricky Rackman's in it, and a friend of mine, uh, a new gun, really saved my ass on that one because he. Um, shot a lot of the interviews in California that would have been okay. expensive for me to fly out and shoot. And he, he, he did that for me. So he, he played a big part in getting that movie done. Then when it came time to 
you know, shopping around and everything, I was getting interest, but uh, I had to clear the songs. And so that's, you know, another, I guess it's horror, very horror ish because it, it just, <laughs> You know, right. I was, me and Universal Music going back and forth for six months and me getting passed along from uh, person to person because either somebody got fired or promoted. So I had to start all over again with somebody new every two weeks. And so one day I woke up and I was like, you know what? I, I, I put my really put my heart and soul into this thing, really proud of the way it came out, put it out for free. And so it's on YouTube. And uh, and uh, really, really happy with it, man. It's uh, it's brutally honest. It's not a fluff piece. And uh, and. And it lives on, you know, it didn't really promote it that much. It just kind of mm-hmm. like a to be discovered kind of thing, you know, but, but, but with dwellers were, we, we got a premiere at the mad monster party in North Carolina in February. I believe if all goes well, I'm, I'm about 95% done with the movie. Just got to do some overdubs and everything. I'm going to do this weekend. And, um, <clears throat> and then if we might, it's looking like we're going to have like a West coast premiere too. I, I'm here in the man's Chinese theater. <laughs> I'm like, it's like this, you know, <laughs> I have no business having a red carpet premiere at a man's Chinese theater, right. but if that's in the cards, okay, I'll show up, you know, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, I, I, as you can tell, I'm very self-deprecating because I have, you know, I, I, I play guitar for Bang Tango. I mean, you know, it's the how I end up here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you, you also recently played guitar on a uh, bonus track of a uh, covers album. Um, you and another person from the Chicagoland area covered a very famous Chicagoland band. Um, Absolutely, yeah, Chip. A chip, a Chip's enough. We did yeah. a Down by Cheap Trick. And it was funny because uh, it was about six months ago, me and Dave were doing the Lucid album, and Dave was like, we should do a cover song. This is before I knew he was doing a covers album. Mm-hmm. And I always loved Down by Cheap Trick. I always loved that song. And it's like kind of like a... It's like the roots of alternative grunge in there too, you know, right. in, in a way, because it's got those really gnarly heavy parts in there, and uh, and uh, and so I was like, hey, what about Down by Cheap Trick? Because I knew Dave like uh, Cheap Trick, and he was like, yeah, well, yeah, I'm all for it. Then I reached out to Chip; he was all for it and everything. And then um, uh, we had Vin from Lucid on there, and, uh, and and Mike and all that and everything, and it uh, it came out really cool. We we're gonna do an alternate mix for the Lucid album, I believe. Okay, but. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, the, the hidden bonus track, and they they, they spelled my name wrong, but that's okay. It's, uh, it adds, adds, that's like what you and Dave were talking about earlier, how uh, the, the the misprints on the uh, on the on the vinyl back in the day right. and all that. So so like on this track, it's it's not Drew Forty Eight, it's Drew Frontier. There and, you go. Uh, that, that's, yeah. that sounds like uh, an eighties uh, actor. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, not New Frontier, but yeah. Drew Frontier. The, so, uh, coming theaters <laughs> near you, Drew Frontier. <laughs> Yet another action movie. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's the perfect uh, Drew Frontier space. You know? I may have to change my name now. The, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Drew Frontier in space. The Drew Frontier. There you go. <laughs> Drew Frontier and Zen from Mars. Oh, yeah, that's right. Zen from Mars. That's cool. We're doing the Mars Attacks podcast because it's Zen from Mars. <laughs> but, uh, go. oh, yeah, that, that was a. Uh, Man, that's that was one hell of a project too. That's uh, man, it's, it's it's been five years and we're still mixing the thing, <laughs> but we're almost done though. But uh, yeah, it, it's up to you if you want to touch upon that. But uh, but yeah, it, it it came out really good. It came out great. Sure, I, I mean you're obviously doing a lot of different things from the musical standpoint, uh, from Bang Tango to Zen from Mars to this Lucid album. Um, which which of the three are we gonna hear? material from first oh uh, i'd say lucid probably lucid okay and it's, and it's funny because that that came together so quick you know and i was joking too as it was going on because me and mike uh, the drummer from lucid we're, we're also in zen from mars and i was like dude i, I guarantee this lucid album is going to come up before the zen from mars album sure enough it's looking like it right. but uh but th- there's uh there's gonna be two versions of the zen from mars album and uh one was mixed by Richard Easterling, one by uh, Lussa Lamert, who's also mixing the Lucid album. And, uh, and so it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how that, uh, how that plays out. I'm really, really proud of the music, you know, and, uh, and, and the way that whole thing came together. Because Chips and Up's on there, and uh, uh, Bryn Ahrens from the band Flip, you know, Stephen Chirot from Kick Trace, he's singing, singing his ass off. He did an incredible job. And uh, Kate Catalina, Chip's wife, uh, plays keys on it. And uh, it's, it's going to have alternate track listings, 
and uh, it, it's gonna be really cool. It's kind of like an ethereal alternative rock metal. It's it's like David. It's like heavy metal David Bowie. <laughs> wow. Okay. Looking forward to uh, hearing that. Um, oh yeah, and 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 Lucid. Uh, oh man, that's that's some of my favorite stuff I ever did. To be honest with you, I mean it's, and Vin from Sponge. Oh my God, he. I've always been a huge Sponge fan, and it's so funny how the whole thing came together because me, Mike, and Dave were working on. Um, uh, some demos together. It's like, let's see where, where this could go, you know? Mm-hmm. And then uh, me and Mike are talking about, who should we get to sing on this thing? And I was like, you know, I've always been a huge Sponge fan. None of us knew Vin. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I found an email on his website, and I just sent an email with one of the tracks. And um, and then sure enough, he uh, he was like, hey, what's going on? This is great. Can I sing on it? And then, <laughs> then we, you know, then we got a whole album after that. We ended up sending him about 30 demos, and he sang on about 11 or 12 of them, and we got nine for the for the record. Wow. And it's 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 really cool. I'll, I'll send you some of the tracks. I'd love your opinion on it. It, awesome. it, it it's really cool. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that, that should be an interesting mix. I mean, I, I love. I have the first two Sponge albums. And oh, I nice. Know, yeah, I know that they're they were you know big Kiss fans and big fans <laughs> of a lot of the same stuff that you know influenced all of us to get into you know the music that we all love. Um, so that I mean that should be really cool. Um, as far as Bang Tango is concerned, do you see them ever uh, releasing anything else in the future? Or? Well, I, I can't speak for them, but I do know uh, I, I loved playing guitar for Bang Tango, man. That was such a great time. You know, I was I was in the band for like what, about three years. And that was after I did the movie, too. I was uh, they, <laughs> yeah, I screened the movie. Then they were like, hey, you want to join? I'm like, of course. And then my like first show with them was uh, in front of 20,000 people at the M3 Festival in wow. Maryland. Oh, that, it was it was nuts, and uh, it was cool. me and Rowan Rowan Robinson was on lead guitar, and uh, for he was from Dio, and oh, it was wow, man, yeah. it was such a great, uh, he was amazing, and I, I love all those guys, and uh, and and the band ended up reuniting last year, and I love every member of Bang Tango, past and present, you know, and uh, and the original guys are just amazing, and it just, man, it's it's such, it feels so good that the original band's back together, you know, because they they had a lot of issues, like if, if you watch the movie and all that and everything, and. Mm-hmm. So happy to see that, and I do know if um, if, uh, if if the if everything unfolds well with the COVID stuff and even like that, I know that they're going to end up doing. They want to do more shows and everything, and, and hopefully some new music because man, it'd be amazing to hear how a new Bang Tango album would sound because they were always for, for forward thinking back in the day. Mm-hmm. Especially if you listen to Dancing on Coals, wasn't really metal or anything. It was more like a, like heavy R and B, you know, with like funk elements and just. It, kind of like Jane's addiction right. and so it'll be interesting to hear where what you know they've all done musically since then and uh and just kind of just hearing that just come out with a new bang tango album i'm sure it would sound in- incredible i'm sure it'd be it'd be great but uh hopefully i'm, I'm hoping they do 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 something new that'd, that'd be really cool. cool how different is it for you to write music as opposed to writing a, a book or putting a movie together are you know is the creativity the same for all three of these things, or do you get sort of different types of reactions uh, for for writing one as opposed to the other? Well, like uh, for for the music part, what I usually do is I uh, fully map out and demo out a fully structured instrumental demo with you know leave space for the verses, choruses, bridge, and all that. Everything just is fully fully structured. And then, um, then I, I send it over to Mike, and it been kind of, you know, he's like, if something needs to change, he'd, he'd be the one to to let me know. It's like, hey, you're playing sloppy over here. What's the matter with you? <laughs> you know, so he's he's always good for that. He's brutally honest, and I love that about him, about Mike. And then, uh, then we when we get it ready to a point, Mike lays down some uh, scratch drums, and then we send it over to the singer. And that's how it worked for Zen for Mars, and and that's how it worked for Lucid as well. And so we get the song, get the the demos to a point where we're me and Mike are comfortable, and then we send it to Dave or uh, or, or Vin. And uh, so and it's it's a, it's a fun process, man, just to hear the song come to life, you know, and just you know, hearing what works and what doesn't work and how to make it work. Right. And with the movie side of things, like with Dwellers, the script from Dwellers is 99% different from what actually got shot. <laughs> yeah, and it's and I just kind of let the like with the music, I just kind of let it dictate where it wants to go itself. Like I never want to force it to sound or be something it isn't, you know? Right. And so with, with dwellers, like a, a lot of the stuff worked on, on uh, paper, like being, uh, as I wrote it, but that didn't work like, you know, being shot. And so I just kind of 
took the basic idea and just kind of rolled with it. And a lot of it's ad lib too. And it, and it just, it came out even better than I ever anticipated. Like it's, it, it's one thing to have to, you know, to have somebody say the same line over and over again for a take, but something so much more fun and organic when you kind of uh, create a moment sure. of, uh, for them to react to uh, and instead of it having to be a certain way, if that makes sense. Right. And, um, and, and with the, with the books, that, uh, you know, I dive in just from top to bottom, like I just start and start putting one word in front of the other. And then um, I, I get done with the chapter and just, I kind of just, uh, I kind of just kind of write as I read. I'm just like, you know, once I get the first couple of paragraphs, I'm like, okay, let's see how it goes. And then I just kind of like, you know, just let it naturally unfold from there. But like, it'd be cool if it goes this direction. Then I send a chapter out to Dave and he's like, oh, dude, this is awesome. You know, then he it puts in his input and everything. And it's, the next thing you know, a couple of weeks later, we got a book. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, the book itself is coming out, what, December 8th? Uh, December 18th, yeah. 18th, and, uh, okay. And and the pre-order's up right now on Barnes and Noble. You could get it as a hardcover, paperback, or ebook, and you could get it as a, a Kindle on Amazon right now. Pre-order. We're gonna have uh, paperbacks via Amazon as well, but for some reason they don't allow you to do pre-orders for paperback. But there will be that. And, and there's also gonna be an audio book too. Oh, wow, that, cool. uh, that Dave uh, Dave already finished that, and that's in the, the process of being uh, being in the process of being processed by uh, audible and all that and that, that usually takes a long time but we started right. that process about a month ago so that that should be popping up soon and uh, uh but uh, yeah at rockstar hitman it's it, we're already got the next couple books already planned out and mapped oh, wow. out and everything and it's uh, it, it's gonna be cool it's gonna be really cool it's funny we, we did this interview yesterday with uh, mitch lafon and alan niven the, uh, mm -hmm. who managed guns and roses and alan had a great idea for one of the books where it would take place in a rehab <laughs> where uh, the sledge is in the rehab and he's got to like take somebody out at the rehab. So we're already throwing around uh, ideas for that. <laughs> so it's, uh, so, so you can see, can see this going from, you know, the book stage to, you know, being some type of a series or being some type of a movie. Absolutely. Uh, the next step, I think, is a graphic novel and we already have an artist for that as well his name is alex sarabia hopefully i'm saying his name right okay. uh Sarabia, alex sarabia but um uh and he uh, amazing artist like and he uh just uh, does amazing work i'm actually having him do some uh new artwork for dwellers as well and we, right. we might even turn that into a graphic novel too and uh oh, cool. and and uh and so I, that's probably going to be within the next six months where uh he's he's going to take a look at the book and just kind of go through and see you know work out the paneling and all that and uh and it's 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 going to work so well as a graphic novel because a lot of it's very graphic <laughs> okay so here's a question for you um mm -hmm. What music do you feel has influenced the movie side of your creativity the most? And Ooh. what movie do you feel has influenced the music side of your creativity the most? Man, that's an amazing, that's a great question. That's a great question. Wow. Okay, so music that would influence the movie side of me. Um, man. Oh, like, uh, like movies, like movies. movies I've done it. I like movies I've done in general or uh, like dwellers and bang Tango movie or like, just like, just, just anything, anything that you, maybe a, a movie as, you know, as a kid or whatever may have influenced you to do something. Cause I mean, we, lo I look back at a band like Iron Maiden, who's yeah. done a ton of, you know, songs people don't realize that are based on movies or books or poetry or, my favorite Iron Maiden song is uh, "Children of the Damned," and that was based off a movie. Yeah, so. and that's such a great song. But um, uh, okay, uh, I as for <laughs> this is such a good question. As for music that would influence the movie side of me, I would safely say, uh, man, I, I am yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna play it safe. I'm gonna go with Faith No More because they're all over the place. Okay, because you know? <laughs> uh, they go from jazz to metal to 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 everything else and. Uh, I've always been a huge Faith No More fan. As for movie, I would say, oh man, I've always loved True Romance. Okay. With, uh, with, uh, with uh, Christian Slater and all. That's such a great movie. And that's, uh, Tarantino wrote that. But that's that's one that I've just always loved that, you know, just works so perfectly all together. It's like one big, wonderful album, I guess, if you will. 
if that makes sense. But uh, it, it, if you were to relate it to a to a to a genre of music, but uh, yeah, True Romance for sure. I, I've always loved that movie. Um, man, that's a good question. I'm going to be thinking about. It. I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night, be like, I got the right answer now. But off the top of my head, I'd say uh, Faith No More and uh, True Romance. Awesome. For sure. mm-hmm. Um, if people want to keep up with everything that you have going on from books to movies to music, where should they go? Is there one specific spot you want them to go to? Oh, uh, you can go to my Facebook. Just, uh, just look up Drew Fortier and, uh, or just, just do, look it up on the Google and all that. It's, 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 it's all on there and everything. And, and, uh, always appreciative for anybody who's into my random buffoonery, if you will, because I always find myself in all kinds of goofy situations. I was actually, I, I wrote a memoir a couple of years ago and I was, that was my like, okay, I'm done with doing all this stuff. I finished the movie, played guitar for Chuck Mose, you faith no more. I did, did all this stuff and everything. It's like, okay, I'm done. Time to walk away. And right. here I am two years later. Now I got another <laughs> album movie book. So it just, the whole process repeats itself. And I'm like, all right, every time I try and get out, it pulls me back in. So I think I'm just going to stick around for a little while. There you go. Awesome. Um, I appreciate your time. I'm, I'm glad yeah. that you reached out to me. Uh, no, really yeah. If you got any other questions, uh, let it go, man. Because that was that was that was a good one. That last one, holy crap. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, just anything you want to ask, man. I I got you. I'll, I'll do my best to come up with an answer. Yeah. Um, well, the, the the biggest thing here is hopefully you know I can have you back on in the future and we can talk about uh, more topics. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I just, just want to make sure that people, you know, uh, are able to check out uh, the book that you're about to release next month um, and that they, you know, have their ears to the ground for Dwellers when, when that's released later on um, next year. So. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I think everybody's going to get a kick out of all these things because – between the the book, the movie, and everything else, it's like uh, at least in my part, there's actually absolutely no pretension anywhere. I'm just yeah. I'm just you know I'm just I'm just a goofy dude from Chicago. You know I'm just like <laughs> yeah, I'm just like you know what the, let's let's keep everything grounded. You know, and that comes off in the movie and comes off in the book uh, for sure. Right. Like it's all just uh, really just kind of makes sense in, in in that regard. And I think people will get a kick out of it. And I think it, I I really hope it finds its audience for sure. Right. Okay, cool. And um, uh, we kind of talked off, you know, um, before the interview and when we started up the interview, I brought up Rocket Pod. Um, yeah. What was that experience like for you uh, to, to be at the convention and to meet people? And, um, and I'm not sure if you got to jam with anyone while there or not, but um, if, if you were trying to sell – that convention to someone what would you recommend from the entire experience oh man i just recommend showing up because that is such a great time for anybody who's even vaguely into music okay. show up to rock and pod eight hours will go by like five minutes because you'll have such a great time just between us looking at everybody's tables all the vendors and they have everything all the panels going on on stage and everything and it's so much fun and i really really hope it happens again uh next year because this past year man um it was going to be a great lineup i think they started yeah. announcing it too i got me and burton from uh, fear factory were going to do an acoustic set actually oh, wow. uh, and uh, him and i were actually going to do like an acoustic like uh, we, we were talking about doing like a like a two-week acoustic tour him and i oh, wow. but uh, but but COVID happened and, and all that and everything and, and burton moved on he's he's just released his new uh, Ascension of the Watchers album, right. which is incredible. People should check that out. And I love Burton. He's, he's a great dude. And I almost did a Fear Factory documentary at one point, too. That's actually how I met Mike Heller. Oh, wow. And so like it's kind of like a weird full circle <laughs> thing right there. And uh, But yeah, Rock and Pod, though, is such an incredible time. I got so many good memories. I remember, uh, if you don't mind, I'll share one. Yeah, go ahead. Last, last year, I did a panel. It was uh, me, Tom Hazard, um it was uh, who was it? Uh, Jason Beeler, Toby Wright, and David Ellison. Okay. And then after, and it was a fun panel. And afterwards, uh, me, Toby Wright, and Jason Beeler did like a signing, you know. And uh, nobody showed up on my side, which I, you know, I, I don't care about. But we were all sitting next to each other, and this one guy showed up to, to Toby's, and uh, in, in front of Toby to have him sign like nineteen thousand uh, like album covers. 
like right. everything he ever did and all that. And it was, and the guy was super cool. We were just chatting with him the whole time. And Jason Beeler had like a line like around the block. Oh wow! And one of the funniest things I've ever heard was Jason Beeler. He's got all these people signing guitars and everything. He turns to us. He goes, "They're all fools. Look at these fools." <laughs> it was hysterical. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, you know, it was funny. It's like Jason is one of the funniest people like in the right. whole entire world. He knows how to play upon a moment. Mm-hmm. perfectly his timing is impeccable and everybody loves him as they should and he's got a new album coming out too i'm plugging everybody's stuff he's got a new album there coming out go. too and that, that, that's gonna be awesome um, but uh, yeah everybody should check out rock and pot if it comes back everybody just you know that that should be the mecca of uh rock cons uh for sure everybody should flock to nashville for rock and pot go say hi to to everybody there yeah i i agree 100 percent. not not because i'm biased because i'm kind of part of the behind the scenes Seems team, but uh, you know it's definitely something that I'd love to be able to get out to one of these years. So, um, yeah, J- Jason is uh, someone that uh, a lot of people have recommended uh, when it comes to following a musician on social media because of his wit and because of the stuff that he posts. Oh man, he is, and he's even funnier in person, man. That dude, he could do a he could do a stand up album easy. He is hysterical. Man, he's, he's uh, it, you know, he, he's a great dude. He's so much fun. So I hope, I hope you guys have him back uh, for the next one, too, because he's so great with the fans, and he's just so great with everybody. You know, he's, he's great. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't divulge much because, obviously, I'm not part of that side of things, but I do have conversations uh, um, oh, yeah, about right. people that may or, or may not go. And uh, um, to my knowledge, he was someone that there were talks about him coming back, um, which which definitely would be cool. And I mean, I listened to the song that he's already released uh, for his upcoming solo album. It sounds cool, you know. It, oh yeah, yeah. It, it definitely reminds me of you know some of what he did with Saigon Kick. Reminds me a little bit about. Um, Maybe some of the stuff that Extreme did, like kind of on the Queen side of things, you know. Right, it's it's a little proggy, you know, and yeah, uh, there's definitely yeah. like uh, definitely a lot of like layers to the to the track. It sounded really cool, you know. Um, so oh yeah, I'm yeah. Looking, looking forward to that. Yeah, absolutely. Apology. I think the song is called Apology, and uh, yeah. and it's uh, it's oh man, yeah, yeah. Jason's such a talented character, and I really hope you if. The, Rock and Pot happens again. You make your you make it out for it, man, because it'd be great to hang out with you in person, you know. Yeah. And um, and some of the stuff you and I were talking about, like holy crap, like I was saying, you you should write a book, man. You really should. Wow. <laughs> I, I I appreciate that. I don't I don't know what kind of uh, I I would be I think at the uh, side of the desk with you with like no one in line. I I think uh, we would be chatting with one another. Um, and that's fun too. Hey, yeah. either way, it, it's fun too. It's just, just just happy to be there. And hey, either way, if that's the situation, you and I would be chatting with each other. You know. There, there you <laughs> go. So um, I, I want to end things with the question that I asked David Elfson to uh, start the interview portion of the show out. Um, I asked him that you know Thanksgiving is tomorrow, holiday season is officially underway. Um, I think we all have memories of receiving an album for Christmas. Um, is there an album that comes to mind for you that you still think back to uh, getting it uh, for Christmas? Man, that's a good question. Wow. Huh. I remember movies vividly, okay. but uh, but uh, album, though. Man, I was just... Growing up, I was always just, uh, you know, I'm actually a huge Megadeth fan. Like I've always, I'm like a Megadeth geek. I don't let Dave know that too much, but uh, <laughs> but I'm like a Megadeth nerd. Right. Um, so like definitely like even like if Megadeth puts out anything, I always like yep, oh, yoink, buying it. And the same thing with like Faith No More and uh, Led Zeppelin. Like I, I had all the box sets and all that and everything. Like right. even if they re- remastered it, just like a little. Itty bitty bit. I'm like, oh my god, it's still Led Zeppelin. Yeah. You know, and uh, <laughs> same thing with, with with all those bands. I mean, um, and uh, there, I probably got a Face No More something or other at some point, a Megadeth something or other. I've, I've always I've always been big into those two for sure. Guns and Roses. I mean, when Guns and Roses came out, Chinese Democracy, that was like Christmas for everybody. Sure. But uh, <laughs> and uh, and I I love that album. That's one of my favorites, man. I love Chinese Democracy. I know a lot of people are into it, but I've always. I was a part of the wait for it. So when it finally came out, I was like, oh, thank God. 
But uh, you know what? Since Chinese Democracy, actually Chinese Democracy, you're not going to believe this, but I remember this. It came out like November 23rd, 2008. Mm -hmm. So that was around Thanksgiving. So that was around the holidays. I'm going to go with Chinese Democracy because I did, I did get that when it came out, the day it came out. Chinese Democracy for sure. Well, you mentioned movies. What movie uh, springs to mind? Oh man, I was like, I remember, it was like, probably like six or seven. The first Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Wow. I've always, yeah, my my parents were just like, watch whatever you want, so I did. And so, uh, yeah, Evil Dead, Army of Darkness, Chud, you name it, all the all the video nasties from back then, all the obscure horror movies like, geez, what was it uh, like Anthropophagus and Bad Dreams and all the weird Italian horror movies like Zombie and of course all the Romero movies, Day of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead, and everything. I, I'm a horror movie nerd, man, big time. So, but yeah, so it was always those obscure horror movies that I'd, I'd, I'd always loved the most. But the, one of the first ones was Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I, I still love to this day. That's the original. The original on VHS, but you know they, they clean it up for Blu-ray and DVD, and it just takes away its charm, you know, because you want that grittiness. You want that, like, you know, where it just looks like crap. And it kind of adds to the whole thing, right. you know, kind of kind of like Dwellers, because that looks like crap, too, and it adds to the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, there, there, there are some, some things, things that are shot, shot a certain way to, to, to add to the, you know, the ambiance of the whole thing, thing to the, what, what they're, they're trying to, to add to it. I often um, have had a conversation with people where I, I'm a really big fan of the HBO limited series Band of Brothers. And yeah. there are a lot of people that I know that said, well, you know, it, it, I don't like the way it was shot. I said the way it was shot was to give it a certain feel of grittiness, as you're saying, it's a modern, you know, modern, quote unquote. I think it's almost 20 years old now. But when it came out, it was modern for its time, and they shot it in a way to make it feel like you were back in the 40s. You know, it was done a certain way to, to add to, to the movie. Exactly. See, I noticed that too with uh, Public Enemies. Because it, it, it almost looks like it's shot on video. It's just shot right. like a certain way. And it just it definitely adds a, a, a whole other level to it. And I was watching it. I was like, am I accidentally watching like a rough cut of this or something? <laughs> it just it, It's so gritty, but it definitely it, it works for it so well. Sure. You know? So, I mean, it's it's like uh, recording with Pro Tools, but recording in the room together. You know, it's using old techniques to, and leveraging, you know, newer techniques to try to Try, try to get something or give it a feeling of what things used to feel like, I guess. Yeah, exactly. It's like the more things change, the more they stay the same. You know, it's like there technology could keep on progressing and all that, but there's, you know, still that uh, human element you just kind of, you know, got to get back to just to kind of, otherwise everything sounds like EDM. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Well, I want to thank you for uh, jumping on the show with us tonight. Um, thank you so much, man. This was a blast. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope to have you back on in the future. We'll talk about uh, other stuff. So, awesome. Yeah, anytime, man. Any, absolutely anytime I'm there, man. Just, just let me know, and I'll, I'll hop on whenever you want. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks, thanks again, and, and we'll be in touch. That sounds great, buddy. Thank you so much, awesome. Victor. Thanks. All right, take care. All right, guys. So that was that was live. That whole thing was uh, was live there. Hope you guys enjoyed that. And uh, I thank you guys for hanging on in there. the The show has been going on a little uh, longer than what we usually do, and we will be or I will be back on Friday to do this same old, same old. Not sure if I'll wrangle anyone in or not, but. Um, but we'll see. Uh, I'm gonna clean these up a little to kind of keep the uh, gaps out. So if you're if you're watching this live, this is this has been a unique experience. Uh, I want to thank everyone that's chimed in in the chat. Mike Jones, uh, we were talking about the live albums before. He said that Ozzy's "Speak to the Devil" was number two for him. Uh, Jeremy Weltman said that the interview with Elson was great. Interesting interview. Awesome. Glad you were able to listen to it. And, um, and again, we had uh, my relative in Connecticut. Jose has uh, chimed in, and he enjoyed uh, both interviews. Great. I, I appreciate you guys all hanging in there with me, everyone that's listened to both, whether you guys watch it live or whether you watch it later on on YouTube or check out the podcast version. 
Uh, just remember that the usual is Friday nights at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. or not 5 p.m. 11 p.m. <laughs> in the UK. And for those that are in uh, Central European time, uh, it is midnight between Friday and Saturday. So I want to thank you guys once again, and we'll see you in a few days. And for those of you that are in the state celebrating Thanksgiving, please have a happy and safe Thanksgiving. Please stay safe. Um, and that is pretty much it, guys. Uh, thanks. We will see you in a few days. See ya.